Okay. Um, of course, the department chair and the booklet organizer are both not here, so I'm left to introduce myself. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, I'm, some of you know me as a COS 740 um, uh, instructor, so, uh, and probably most people in this room know who I am anyway. So, uh, so I'm Jim Lambers, uh, one of the uh, analysis uh, research active faculty. And uh, this uh, presentation that I'm giving today uh, is one that gives, the, unlike most presentations of, in this kind of uh, venue um, that focus on a particular research project, it's actually an overview of three of them. So it gives a broad idea of what my uh, research program is about. Um, it's actually an update of the talk I gave when I interviewed here way back in uh, 2009. Uh, but a lot has happened since then, so we'll see I'll mention several of my students, and you'll see what uh, they're up to. Um, and while we have uh, you know, some undergrads here uh, for my uh, Math 25 class, um, well, while the, the talk is generally aimed at a higher level than that, uh, when possible, I will uh, point out certain things that relate to uh, what we tend to see in classes, such as uh, such as Math 25. So. Um, if there is some or a lot or nearly all that you can't follow, that's okay. Um, but I'll give you what, what uh, tidbits I can. Okay. Uh, I should just be careful. You sometimes sleep, so that was why. Oh, okay. All right. <coughs> okay, so recording is for students who um, wanted to attend but can't. Um, okay, so, uh, so as I mentioned, this talk breaks down into uh, three parts. Uh, so first is on the, my, the main focus of my research, is certainly since I've been here um, at USF. Um, so queer of subspace spectral methods are my own creation uh, for my PhD, um, and they're used to solve uh, uh, time-dependent partial differential equations as opposed to the ordinary, ordinary differential equations that some of you are dealing with uh, now in my class. Um, and you'll see them in this talk applied to uh, a variety of problems, um, as well as and, um, this, one of those problems that are applied to um, is from uh, image processing. You can actually describe the task of enhancing an image, whether it is uh, Moving noise or fussiness from the image, or sharpening the image, as uh, the solution of a, a partial differential equation. Uh, so that is the uh, second part of the talk. Um, and then uh, the third part is basically my former life. Before I came to USM, I was in the Department of Petroleum Engineering at uh, my own graduate alma mater, Stanford University. Um, and so I'll talk about the work I did there that aids in uh, oil reservoir. Uh, simulation. So, I mentioned uh, a few colleagues. Uh, so, Maya Tokman at uh, University of California Merced, uh, Patrick Badati, University of California Irvine, and um, Mark Garrison um, at Stanford. Uh, so, this is why I spend so much time in California uh, because of uh, continuing to work with these colleagues. Um, so, this is one example. Uh, one of the more important different, uh, partial differential equations out there, uh, Maxwell's equations, um, that, uh, that I, and I came across these equations uh, for interest in, due to my interest in the problem of uh, modeling the uh, diffraction of light on a uh, uh, periodic grating. Um, so uh, E and H are, these are uh, three-dimensional vector fields uh, representing uh, electric and magnetic magnetic fields. Uh, then we have coefficients, uh, mu and epsilon, uh, that refer to uh, magnetic permeability and electric permeability. And uh, what you can do is, if you take these two equations, um, and uh, so you see an operation that you've seen in calculus four, uh, taking the curl of a vector field. If you take the curl again of uh, these two equations, you actually get, um, uh, and also take advantage of uh, these relations, then you're able to separate the equations for 
uh, E hat and H hat, because you can see up here, uh, they're coupled together. But now they're separate, so now you can solve for them independently of one another. And what we have is, um, these first couple terms, the second derivative with respect to time, and then uh, this delta here is the Laplacian, which I introduced in uh, Cal 4, which is the sum of all the second partial derivatives with respect to the same variable twice, so like EXX plus EYY plus EZZ. Uh, these first two terms constitute what is uh, popularly known as the wave equation. Uh, but as a model, for instance, uh, displacement of a vibrating uh, string, for instance. Uh, and then we have these additional terms here. So here we have one form of Maxwell's equations that I'm interested in solving. Um, and uh, when the coefficients, mu and epsilon, are not constant, that's the case I'm interested in, when they depend on x, y, and z, that's when this problem becomes uh, particularly challenging. Okay. Um, now, for any problem like this, there are methods out there for solving them. What I'm interested in is basically building a better mousetrap, finding, uh, developing more effective methods for solving these problems, because for any of these that I'll discuss here, these are not being worked out by hand. It's a computer that's doing all the work. Um, but computers are getting more and more powerful. Uh, they have you know, more memory, they're, they're faster, um, and it, they, they change, they advance significantly on these fronts uh, every few years. Uh, but the trouble is that mathematics doesn't keep up with the technology. Um, and this is really what the first part of this talk is about, is as computers become more and more powerful, just as you know, consumers expect more lifelike video games, uh, researchers expect more accurate, uh, more uh, lifelike simulations, uh, higher resolution, uh, just like you get in, just like you expect high resolution in your, in your pictures, etc. So, um, but the mathematical methods used to perform simulation at high resolution, they were developed decades ago, uh, or even over 100 years ago. And they run into difficulties when you have this kind of uh, high resolution. And uh, how that translates is, um, for instance, one of the most the best known methods for Maxwell's equations is called the finite difference time domain method, also developed a very long time ago. And uh, what happens is, as you try to solve Maxwell's equations and you want a finer resolution in space, because um, what you're doing is you're uh, solving a problem on a grid in X, Y, and Z. So you have spacing, delta X, delta Y, delta Z. As that spacing gets smaller, you also have a time step, you're doing delta T, that's going to get smaller also, much smaller. So the computational time increases uh, substantially, and the methods I'm going to describe are meant to um, work around that. Um, so the idea is, um, be because these problems are so difficult, they're so difficult due to the fact that low frequency and high frequency components are coupled together. You cannot solve for them independently. Um, and it's those high frequency components that really uh, constrain you as far as your computational time. So what I propose doing is, if your solution, you can think of it as a collection of waves, low frequency and high frequency waves added together. This is called superposition, a term I've recently brought up in my uh, Math 285 class, and it means the same thing as in, in that context. Um, so uh, the idea is to treat these components differently, use a different approximation strategy for each of them, instead of treating them with a one-size-fits-all approach, as current methods tend to do. Um, so instead of talking about Maxwell's equations, I'm going to scale down to a much simpler uh, type of partial differential equation, something like this, like du dt plus lu is equal to zero. <coughs> L uh, is a differential operator. In fact, uh, those of you in my uh, DE class that have, I've just been talking with differential operators, it came up today. I'm referring to that here. I just don't have the same square bracket notation that I use in class. Um, so for something like this, uh, where my solution u depends on, uh, say, uh, the spatial variables x and y, but also on time, um, I have to describe uh, each frequency component of a solution um, as follows. So what I'm doing here, this is the, um, angle, the angle bracket notation, refers to what is called inner product. Really what I'm doing is, I'm taking the product of this uh, wave function, e to the omega x, where omega is a frequency, uh, multiplying it by this, and then integrating over my spatial domain. For instance, it could be, the, uh, in this case, the interval from uh, 0 to 2 pi. 
And that gives me this, uh, what is this? This is, if my solution is a bunch of waves at different frequencies that are referred to by omega, this conveys the amplitude and phase shift. So I need to know frequencies, uh, amplitude and phase shifts on my waves to, to see what my solution looks like. So if I can obtain these, then that's a way of describing my solution in what is called frequency space. Now, it's been said that mathematics is the art of reducing all problems to linear algebra, and that's exactly uh, what I've done here, um, where this expression, where we take a function, <coughs> multiply by another function, but this exponential right here, you can think of it as, it's analogous to taking a function of a matrix, because L is a differential operator. When you discretize, that's like, um, it, becomes, it, it uh, is represented by a matrix. So I have the inner product or dot product, if you will, of a vector with a function of a matrix times another vector. So U transpose F of A, B. So it's this kind of generic expression, but now I'm interested in approximating. So um, it was back in the early 90s as I was getting into my research that I was studying partial differential equations, but I wound up with this kind of linear algebra problem. So I asked my advisor, uh, Gene Gollum, who was actually my second advisor, and he was uh, one of the, uh, he really was the foremost researcher in the world on numerical linear algebra. Um, I asked him, you know, back in this 1994, how do you solve this kind of problem? Uh, I figured somebody had worked on it, and actually he had himself. Uh, so Gollum and Ron uh, wrote this uh, paper I'm going to share with me about uh, this. And how we solve this is actually mixing um, linear algebra and uh, uh, calculus. Um, so in my context, um, U is some simple wave function that has a uniform frequency omega. Um, here, this is a complex form, but you can think of this as cosine omega x or sine omega x. Um, and then the vector v is my solution from a previous time, and I'm trying to advance to the next time. Um, and then my matrix A is a representation of my differential operator, um, L. And then my function, F, is, in uh, the example I gave earlier, is going to be e to the minus, uh, e to the minus lambda t. Um, so how can, so given these pieces, I want to approximate this, because in my case, computing this directly looks like, oh, you just go ahead and compute it. Not really, because the matrix A is incredibly large. Uh, on the order of maybe hundred thousands of entries, you know, rows and columns, or even more. Um, and the function itself, F, um, may not be easy to compute. Um, so um, I'm interested in computing what's called a matrix exponential. And um, the uh, there's actually a well-known paper called uh, 19 Dubious Ways to Compute the Matrix Exponential, as in there aren't really any uh, particularly great ones. And it actually has now been updated to 21 dubious methods. So that's the problem I have. I need to find some way to compute this approximately. And this is where calculus comes in, because I can actually represent this, an expression from linear algebra, as an integral, uh, where A and B are the smallest and largest eigenvalues of a matrix A. Um, and this is not your garden variety integral like you see, you see in our calculus courses. It's not, a, it's not a Riemann integral, which is what we normally teach with, but it's a riemann skilchis integral uh, defined in terms of uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of your matrix A. But even though it's a very different flavor of integral, I can still approximate it using the same methods that are used for like ordinary Riemann um, integrals. Um, so one of the most uh, uh, effective ways to approximate integrals is called using Gauss quadrature rule. Um, I teach about those in uh, Math 460, the first numerical analysis course uh, that I'll be teaching in the fall. So if you're an undergrad, come sign up um, and you learn all about that. And uh, so the idea is in any quadrature rule, which is based on in fact, we're approximating this area and the curve by areas of quadrilaterals, like rectangles. What I need to do is evaluate this function f at selected points between a and b to get
get the heights of my rectangles, and then I need weights, which serve as the widths of my rectangles. So you may remember from calculus two, where before you learned how to integrate the easy way, you would approximate area of a curve by uh, doing uh, uh, by computing sums of areas of rectangles, and you, you were told to do like left end points, right end points, or midpoints. It's kind of like that, uh, really, except in this case, a whole lot more accurate than, than that approach. Um, and what I actually do is not just a single integral, but four integrals. So, because um, here I have my vectors u and b, and if I group them together in a plot, <laughs> and I try to compute a two by two matrix integrals in a single integral, what I found just by trying this out a long time ago, I uh, get a whole lot more accuracy than I um, otherwise would. Um, so another algorithm from my advisor um, called the block Lanchos algorithm um, is uh, what I use in this case. So I have um, you know, my, my two vectors u and v, and if I make them orthonormals, in other words, they're perpendicular to one another, and they are normalized to be unit vectors, then this iterative process here um, produces just the matrix I need to uh, get the job done. It produces a block tridiagonal matrix. Tridiagonal because we only have non-zero entries along these three diagonals and everything else, or empty spaces, is zero. Each of these blocks is a two by two uh, matrix. So, so block, block, block Lanchel's algorithm forms this matrix for me and then by computing these eigenvalues, I get the best possible points to plug into my function f. Right here, this is my quadrature rule. Uh, length j are being nodes, so we can them as x values and plug into my integrand f. Um, this expression, uj, uj transpose, this is a two by two matrix. You can think of it as a matrix valued weight. So for a single integral, you can think of it as a width of a rectangle, but here it's widths for four different um, sets of rectangles. And this gives me an approximation of uh, this matrix valued integral. But that is the same thing as taking my function f and applying it just to this matrix. And the idea is my original matrix A, like I said, very large. This matrix is not. The value of k, for my purposes, very small, um, two or three. So we're talking like a four by four or six by six matrix <coughs> here. So by working with a matrix this small, I can approximate u transpose f of AB, where A is a matrix that's literally thousands of times larger per dimension, so millions of times larger um, in, in terms of the number of entries. So I save myself a lot of computation time. Okay, so, so how am I going to apply this to a garden variety partial differential equation such as this? This is the wave equation um, indicated by the second derivative with respect to time, and L is some second order differential operator in space. So the simplest form of a wave equation is UTT is equal to UXX. Uh, that could be used to model, for instance, a, the displacement of a vibrating string. I'm interested in vibrations happening in uh, more complicated media uh, where, where the properties are not, are, are not constant. Does something go on for recording? Mm, I think it is recording, but some, some web page was in front of it. Wow. Oh, okay. Well, I just removed that. I okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, the color keeps changing. It's kind of weird. That's okay. It's, I can enhance it later. Um, so here's the, the partial differential equation. Here are the two initial conditions. It's two because we have a second order time derivative. Just like in my differential equations class, we're studying second order equations now. So very again, you need two, two initial conditions. But because um, we're not just dealing with time, we're also dealing with space. Those initial conditions are not constant values, they're functions of x. Uh, we also, for a spatial component, we have these boundary conditions. In this case, we make it 2 pi periodic for simplicity. Here's my second order differential operator. Similar, uh, uh, so here we have, uh, basically, this is, by the time you work this out, there's a second derivative with respect to x. And we assume that these coefficients are, you know, p is positive and q is not negative. Okay, so if I want to solve an equation like this, I can represent the solution 
using this operator is called a propagator, where what I'm doing is I'm taking um, my differential operator L, and instead of just taking exponentials of it, I'm taking sines and cosines of it. And you can, you can uh, figure out what that means by using a Taylor series, uh, like you learned about in Cal 3, or uh, whether it's for exponential or sine or cosine. You can work out what these are in terms of powers of L using um, a, a Taylor series. So if I apply this to my initial data, so like my f of x and my g of x, then I can have a formula for a solution at any time. But I can't compute this exactly because I'm dealing with a very large um, uh, matrix that represents this operator L. Again, I need to compute it approximately. So these functions that go in these entries here give me the integrands in the riemann stiltjes integrals that I described before that I need to now approximate. And what I'm doing with wave equations <coughs> is, because of the second order time derivative, really what I'm doing is I'm computing the solution and its first derivative in respect to time together. Because you have your two initial conditions, you have your f and g, which are your solution and time derivative at the start, and you keep updating both of them as you advance uh, from your initial time, like zero, to your, your final time. So what my Quillos subspace spectral methods do is I evaluate two sets of these Riemann stiltjes integrals. So for each frequency, I have one of my, one of my basis functions, my, my wave functions. So you can this is like uh, e to the i omega x, or it could be cosine omega x, or sine omega x, paired with the solution in this case, paired with this time derivative in this case. So then I, um, but these vectors, I need them to be orthonormal like I described before, uh, perpendicular and, um, and normalized. So my QR factorization, a standard regular linear algebra algorithm, accomplishes that. And then I can take x1 and x1 tilde and feed those into my block Langell's iteration now described earlier. And now each one of these terms in square brackets is the approximation of one of these riemann stiltjes integrals that describes the my uh, Fourier coefficient, in other words, gives me my amplitudes and phase shifts of my waves that describe my solution. So then all these waves from different frequencies, these values of omega here, are added together uh, to get the uh, entire solution. Now, uh, compared to other methods that one might learn about uh, for solving partial differential equations, numerical methods, like I'll be teaching about in my course this summer, uh, Math 721. So any of you grad students will be around during June. Um, if you want to learn about that, come join us. Um, com but compared to the kind of methods that I would teach about in a course like that, uh, admittedly, this is a bit of overkill. There seems like a whole lot of work compared to those other approaches. But there's a good reason for it. First of all, uh, high order accuracy in time. The higher the power of delta t, because delta t is already small, this is describing the error. We want this error to be as small as possible, so we uh, um, so a higher power is, is, is going to be more advantageous. So, uh, so so even with a small value of k, because it gets multiplied by four here, uh, we get very high order accuracy. So the number of quadrature nodes I need, which is capital K, two would be enough, because then I would get actually uh, in the end result the six order accuracy in time, which is much higher than most other methods. Um, also, this term is key, unconditionally stable. What that means is, uh, unlike other methods where you must choose a very small time step in order to have a solution that has a correct qualitative behavior, like a solution that is bounded when it's, when it's supposed to be, or decaying exponentially when it's supposed to be, um, I can get that correct qualitative behavior even if I choose a large time step. Um, so I don't have to worry about my solution blowing up on me because I chose my time step too large. Um, so normally the only way you get that is are what are called implicit methods, where you have to solve a large system of equations. I don't have to do that. I'm not solving any large systems. It's all small matrix computations. Um, so I was able to prove that, at least for these simple cases, and I believe it can be proved for more difficult ones. I just haven't been able to do that yet. Or maybe I can get one of my students to do it. So um, the, 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 the point is that you know, we have two types of time stepping methods, explicit methods that you think of it as like plug and chug, where you can, the computations are relatively simple to advance from one time step to the next, but that time step must be incredibly small 
or implicit methods that um, you, don't, you can get away with a larger time step, but you have a lot more work to do to get it. Uh, you have to solve some incredibly large system of equations, and that introduces other difficulties. So KSS methods have the best properties of both. Um, and the reason why is because it treats each frequency component of individual attention um, instead of using the same approximation strategy for all of them. So giving it individual attention seems to be impractically expensive, but there's always a way to work around that. And those, those are the improvements that I've made with my students for the last few years. Now, I've been talking about a single PDE. Maxwell's equations is not. It's a system of PDEs coupled together. So we have to uh, generalize to that. Um, and due to time, yeah, um, I'm not going to really spend time on this slide. The point is, there is a way to do that um, through studying whatever differential operators or matrix differential operators you're working here. So that generalization has been done. Um, and we see uh, very high order accuracy. This is a 3D case. Um, you know, not many grid points per dimension, but then to keep in mind whatever number of grid points here, I have to cube that because it's 3D. Um, so we're still talking about a lot of grid points. And then we have, we get uh, the uh, errors decreasing by a factor of roughly 64, <coughs> which is in the, in, from, uh, as I cut the time step in half, which is indicative of six order um, accuracy. And as I increase the number of grid points, um, I do not have to decrease delta t. Normally I would, but in this case I can keep it the same and I get in fact more accuracy than before instead of having to worry about uh, uh, stability. Um, some students I've had recently, so my uh, one PhD student so far is finished, Alex Dimitrika, former master student, Lisa Palchak, they worked on um, ways to estimate these uh, uh, quadrature nodes. Um, so instead of the approach that I described, which them exactly, we can kind of fake it um, and at least get in the ballpark, and that is a whole lot faster. Um, a problem that I really love to apply to comes from the semiconductor industry, where uh, at a nanoscale, measurement is performed by uh, diffracting light across a periodic grating, like for instance, like on a uh, semiconductor wafer, because you can't just do ordinary measurement. What you do instead is you solve Maxwell's equations for many different parameter values, like thousands of them, and you have a library of solutions. Then you perform the actual you know, diffraction of light across what you've manufactured, and you compare that to your library of solutions, find the best match. Whichever is the best match reveals the parameters, and you can check, are they correct? Was this manufactured correctly? Um, and if not, um, what do you do about that? Um, so, uh, but the trouble is, with this periodic grading, we have discontinuities in the coefficients, and, uh, and that complicates things significantly. I've had several students at one time or another work on problems with discontinuous coefficients, like in this case, it's piecewise constant. Uh, Elise Garon did an honors thesis on it, um, and uh, um, Samaya Shigoslami, who's in the room, is working on a generalization of that, where you have more jumps, uh, like in this example here, uh, Abdullah Arco, and, doing a 2D case. Um, Sarah Long and current honor students also uh, a similar problem. Uh, so there's, there's lots of advancements to make because this is a much harder system PDEs and I'd love to have somebody work on that. Um, other PDEs that these have been applied to in the meantime, um, so heat equation, um, which is actually the first one they were applied to, I just didn't discuss that here. That uh, heat equation, uh, most of you who are in my 285 class or took 280 with me last semester, I derived it at the end of uh, that course. The uh, time dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, since even though it's a fundamentally different equation than the heat equation in terms of its behavior, algorithmically, how you um, apply it is essentially the same. Um, time independent problems. So my uh, about to finish PhD student, uh, Megan Richardson, has done some work on that in the um, uh, case of uh, polar cylindrical geometries. Um, and we're working on applying these to uh, model other kind of phenomena, uh, tumor growth. So Lisa Gahn is doing your master's thesis on that. Uh, photo <coughs> genetics, where you take a laser and bleach a cell to study the movement of proteins. So Samaya is working on that. Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so my new PhD student, Brianna Bingham, who is, is she here? Oh, you are here, okay, sorry. Yeah, so 
lot of people in this room are working on these things. So, um, okay. Um, and this is kind of a segue into the, uh, the second part of the talk, image processing, where I'll just show this video here. I figured when I use this for an interview talk, I'd have a better chance of getting a job if I had more visuals and video clips. So I went all out with five of them in. It seemed to work. Um, so solving this PDE with the kinky graph, um, the oscillatory function, as the, uh, I'm trying to get this to restart, so you can see again from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, for this as the initial data, you see over time it smooths out to a piecewise, roughly a piecewise linear curve. That's what happens is a one-dimensional version is easier to see of image enhancement. Um, because the oscillations represent noise. You're trying to remove that noise. Um, so here is an example. I did this in uh, my differential equations class not too long ago. The, uh, fractional differentiation. Uh, so um, my colleague at UC Irvine, Patrick Gadotti, uh, developed uh, this equation for that purpose. Um, okay. Uh, another side thing I worked on related to this was um, if I have a differential operator, like in, in, in differential equations classes, you have a nice case of always coefficients being constant. In fact, that's all I'm doing in my class right now. Very rarely an example with coefficients that depend on space or time. But real applications do have coefficients that depend on space and or time. And I'd like to try to make those differential operators have constants that are coefficients that are closer to being constant. So what I have here, I have a made up uh, variable coefficient differential operator. And what I'm doing is I'm substituting here I'm plotting what's called the symbol of the operator. So I plot this as a function of x, so you can see the coefficients. And also, differentiation is replaced by plugging in a frequency variable. So as I go up the graph, these curves at higher uh, y values here, my vertical axis uh, is corresponds to higher and higher frequencies. So for each frequency, I get a more and more oscillatory curve. Because just like if you take sine x versus sine 10x, Sine 10x is obviously a lot more oscillatory. So its derivative is going to be much, much, far, much larger, so we see more oscillation. So uh, what I worked out, this is back when I was a student, um, how to perform transformations of this differential operator to, so if you can transform a leading coefficient, and that's not new, that people know how to do that already, um, but the curves are a lot smoother than they were before, but that, so now there's more uniform oscillation between them. So what I developed was, the leading coefficient with this paired of second derivative, okay, that can be made constant. But what about lower order coefficients, like uh, the zero order term? That's not multiplying a derivative. It's only multiplying uh, a, a function that's not differentiated. By transforming that, you can make these curves almost straight lines. So I can make a, a variable coefficient operator look much more like a constant coefficient one. And that uh, makes uh, numerical solution of, of uh, such PDEs um, a whole lot easier. Um, this is for one dimensional case. I'm trying to work on two dimensions, number generalizations at this point. Again, but having students to work on these things. So. Um, and uh, because whatever you can find the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of a, a differential operator for a PDE, that PDE suddenly becomes very trivial to solve. The trouble is those things are very hard to get, except in certain trivial cases. So I'm trying to work on some of these more complicated cases, such as, like I said earlier, what if you have dis discontinuous coefficients? Uh, so basically a step <laughs> function of some kind um, that describes your, your medium. So I have several students working on various versions of that problem. Um, everything I've described so far for preload subspace spectral methods is on, like rectangular domains, intervals, rectangles, boxes in 3D. I like to move beyond that. Um, so that, that's, that's a key initiative. Um, also, not just using simple wave functions, but maybe, again, for other geometries, uh, different kind of functions to represent a solution, like orthogonal polynomials. That's something that Brianna is going to be looking at after Megan has previously looked at it. Um, Multigrid methods are a very powerful method for solving certain differential equations. Can they and KSS methods help each other? So Haley knows here working on that. Um, I'd like to put a software package on these methods uh, that people can use, um, you know, other researchers. So my new master student, Vivian McLean, is looking at that. 
um, and Versammer is looking at, instead of approximating an integral using a polynomial, which is what I've done to this point, these are decaying exponentials. They have a graph like this. That looks much more like a rational function. So can we do something with that information? So number one of my PhD students, Amber Sumner, is doing that. So in other words, I have a zillion students that I'm keeping busy to try to improve these um, methods. OK. Um, now the second talk is part of the talk is a lot shorter and a lot more visual. Um, and this is my, my joint work with uh, Patrick Bedotti from uh, University of California, Irvine. Um, so this gets to the problem of trying to enhance images, uh, mainly denoising them, removing fuzziness. Um, and back in the 90s, this equation, the Perona Malik equation developed by Perona and Malik, um, was described, it was formulated to try to solve this denoising problem, where u is a function of x and y. And it represents pixel values, like from 0 to 255 uh, in your grayscale image. If it's a color image, you can separate into your RGB components and apply this to each one of the components. And the idea is uh, this equation, once you work out the differentiation using a product rule, uh, what you find is that for certain parts of the image, you are solving basically like a heat equation. So du dt is equal to uh, like uxx plus uyy times a positive coefficient. When it's a positive coefficient, you get smoothing. When it's a negative coefficient, it means you're solving a heat equation backward in time. So instead of exponential decay, you're getting exponential growth, which is very bad. Uh, but if control, you get sharpening. So, so positive coefficient leads to smoothing, negative coefficient leads to sharpening. So this equation is actually an example of what is called an ill-posed problem. In other words, theoretically, a non-starter. Not the problem you even want to touch. But numerically, it works well. And that's why people have been studying it. Uh, but it does have its drawbacks. We get a phenomenon called staircasing, which means these abrupt variations in color that look like a staircase. It gives the image kind of like a cartoonish effect. Um, and. Uh, so uh, the flat regions don't look quite right. So in, so in addition to the difficulty analyzing this equation, theoretically, there's some practical difficulties. So what Patrick set out to do, uh, try a couple different modifications of this equation. Um, where what we do is, we apply differentiation raised to one minus epsilon power, where epsilon is small. So it, we're kind of like we're reining in the, the uh, uh, the amplification that derivatives uh, produce when it comes to uh, high frequencies. Uh, so in other words, the way he would describe it is we're weakening the nonlinearity just a little bit. So here are two, 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 two different models that have performed the same task but with different boundary conditions. Uh, so we try to both out on the various images with different parameter values to achieve different effects. Uh, and uh, so, so what we do is even though an image is a bunch of pixels and we have these pixel values from 0 to 255, like from black to white, we think of it as a function of a continuous function of x and y, and we feed that as the initial data to our partial differential equation, like the one in the previous slides. Um, so, um, and what's interesting is, is it's almost like we're treating these pixel values as temperatures, because we aren't solving some sort of heat equation in a way. Um, so, this, these partial differential equations that Patrick developed, they're well posed, so they can be studied theoretically, and they, uh, they do have better performance uh, actual experiments. Now, in this video, <coughs> watch from the upper left as we move, so we go from left to right up to down, you'll see the image becoming clearer. Because there's fuzziness over here, but it's going away. I've d divided this image into 16 panels, and I'm denoising each one of them uh, separately. Uh, I'll run, I'll show it again. Yeah, as you can see up here, it's cleared up, and down here, and so forth. And now it's about to go, okay, just did up there. Um, so, uh, so this, so this is, uh, Patrick told the equations, I developed the numerical methods, uh, the KSS methods from previous section of this talk, um, to enhance the quality of this image. And so this could be used for denoising. Um, here is a one dimensional example because it's easier to see for sharpening. Um, so we have, um, a, uh, a, a smooth function at first. And it's, 
being sharpened into a function that uh, just has a, a vertical jump up and vertical jump down. So the, unfortunately, the video goes away just as it reaches its final frames, and that's unfortunate. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why my methods for solving these equations are very effective is because, again, an individual attention to high-frequency components, whereas other methods uh, would, those uh, high-frequency oscillations that you see, they, in my case, they go away. But for other methods, they don't. And that's a problem. It's, it's poor image quality. Um, and you can also, uh, we've had good success where you uh, both uh, denoise and sharpen. Uh, in fact, your method's been most successful for most cases where you have both problems in the image, and you can deal with them both at once by selecting the coefficients properly. I don't know if you can see, like in the initial frames, that there was some fuzziness, uh, especially in the closest to the outline of its flower, um, that uh, you can see it going away, and the flower itself is, sharp, is becoming sharper. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so, so what happens is, uh, by finding a different way to deal with the ill posedness of the problematic equation, like what other people did before was they would do what is called regularization, uh, but to deal with this uh, potential exponential growth that was caused by a negative coefficient, they would regularize it. But troubles that would introduce blurring into the image. It was a wrong way to go about the problem. So, um, so we have it. So, so what we do is we just uh, regularize a little differently, and that, uh, in other words, not to as great a degree, um, and that uh, only at high frequencies. So, in both cases, the first two parts of this talk, giving individual attention to these frequencies, um, turn out to be more effective. Um, I have uh, another honor student, uh, Lin Duong, uh, working on. Um, applying these kind of techniques to color images. Okay, and uh, all right, don't want to spend too much more time. But uh, the last part of the talk is from my petroleum engineering work. Uh, so the, the application here, uh, so oil reservoir simulation, um, particularly enhanced oil recovery, because um, after uh, you know, ordinary drilling or water flooding are performed and they can't get any more oil out, much of the oil in the ground is still there. Like uh, I've seen estimates of you know 70% or maybe even up to 85%. So those methods don't recover very much. Um, so the next uh, option would be gas injection, injecting CO2 into the reservoir to mix with the hydrocarbons down below and uh, basically uh, push that to the, the to the surface. Um, the trouble is that's extremely expensive. Um, so oil companies don't want to do that, and especially. Uh, recent years have had depressed oil prices. It was a lot more practical when the price was over $100 a barrel. So um, oil companies need to know if this is a worthwhile investment. So they use simulation to answer these key questions. Um, how long will it take? How long will gas injection take to get out as much oil as possible? How much oil can they expect to recover? Um, and some very nasty partial differential equations are solved to answer these questions to furnish basically a few key numbers to management so they can decide whether they want to go forward or not. And these are incredibly challenging problems, and I was really quite impressed, in fact, that a lot of uh, engineering disciplines, yes, they have a working knowledge of the mathematics, but not really, not like mathematicians do. They don't know all the nuances, but petroleum engineering, they have to get very sophisticated. Um, and you know, there, are not, there are not many real world problems that are more important than this one since we're dealing with energy. Um, but you have coefficients that are not just varying in space, but varying wildly, like over several orders of magnitude. Um, and uh, you have a very large domain because a reservoir takes a lot of space physically. And also your, your simulations, the time domain is large too because these operations literally take years. Um, so we can't just throw a grid over a domain and use a very small delta x, delta y, delta z because uh, where we have fine resolution, because that simulation would take too long. <coughs> As it is, uh, you know, oil companies, they can afford the best supercomputers, but their simulations still take literally a month. Um, so, and that's after I mean, what's called upscaling, to uh, use larger grid blocks, so therefore fewer of them, to reduce computational time. And that's the part that I worked on, uh, as well as uh, gridding. How do you choose an ideal grid? 
You want smaller grid cells where the action is, the most interesting physical phenomenon, and larger grid cells where there isn't anything of particular interest going on. Um, so a very grossly oversimplified version of equations we're solving. Uh, so here is a divergence operator, uh, brought up in Cal 4, this is a gradient, uh, and K is a coefficient that refers to permeability, rock permeability, that again can vary over several orders of magnitude. It's going to be very high when you have some channel in your reservoir where fluid can flow, but if it's really solid rock, it, the permeability is extremely small. Um, so, um, so a very important qu quantity here, flux across a uh, interface, I uh, take the difference in pressure, so you can think of this kind of being like a derivative, um, the difference in pressure values multiplied by what's called a transmissibility, which is obtained from the permeability. So that indicates how free fluid is to flow across some uh, interface. So the way these problems are solved in the finite volume methods is the small cells are at my fine scale, where uh, I'm capturing the reservoir more accurately, but I can't take the time to simulate the reservoir at this fine scale over the whole domain. That's too much. I'd rather use these larger cells, the white blocks here with the dots in the middle. So what I can do is I can solve my equation on this small domain, just locally around this space, <laughs> and then approximate the, uh, um, and then see what the flow is across this space and use that information to figure out how I should uh, approximate my pressure equation at a, at a coarser scale using the, the larger cells. So that's what upscaling is, or one approach to upscaling. That's called local upscaling. You solve a problem locally at a fine scale, use the information to that, from, you gain from that to figure out how to simulate at a core scale across a wider domain. That's uh, actually going to be practical. The, tr the trouble is, if I just use what's called a two-point flux, I'm only using a difference of two pressure values that are on either side of an interface. Um, it's simple, very easy to implement, um, it gives you physically reasonable solutions, but it's not really all that accurate in cases where fluid is free to flow um, at, in whatever direction it wants. So we need a better approach. Um, also, um, using a uniform grid like you see here, not very practical because um, that would result in too many cells, and many of these cells would be in places where there's not really anything of interest going on. You want to have adaptive refinement. Uh, so here where the, uh, the front is, um, if you have, think in terms of uh, fluid advancing from left to right, and here's your uh, front where the saturation is the highest, you want to have smaller cells to simulate that accurately, and then larger cells like way over here where there's nothing going on. Um, so that helps your efficiency, but it's also, it makes the implementation more difficult. Um, so we have to develop some work criteria for that, which I'll skip over now because I want to end this soon. Um, but the reason why this is important is the way this works in oil reservoir simulation is geostatisticians study the, 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 rock, the properties of a reservoir, like rock permeability and so forth, uh, fluid viscosity, etc., And they use geostatistics to come up with a model uh, for a reservoir. And then you simulate that, and that can take a long time. If we can um, perform multiple simulations, so you can do multiple realizations instead of just one, because again, there's that uncertainty due to the statistical aspect of it, um, then you can feed more reliable information to management, the more simulations you can run. So anything that can be done to speed this up is essential. Um, and even if management doesn't know what math goes into it, they certainly get better information. Um, so what I worked on is called a multi-point stencil. Instead of using only points numbers one and two to figure out how to approximate my pressure equation around this uh, dark uh, face in the middle here, I use six points. And um, so then we take some linear combination of those six points to determine the flux instead of just two. Um, but we only want to use these other points, three, four, five, and six, if we absolutely have to. So if the flow is going like in this direction, like directly perpendicular to the face, points one and two would be enough. But if it's at an angle, like starting from where point three is up to point six, then we should use points like one, two, three, and six to describe the flux. So, um, so 
So our approach actually uses an optimization problem where this term is to, we want to try to minimize error in uh, replicating the fine scale flows at a coarse scale. This term is for uh, efficiency and, and robustness. Again, we need physically reasonable solutions. Um, so we want these weights that are away and that are in the red to be as small as possible, but still give us accuracy. So if we only care about accuracy, we only have this term. If we only cared about robustness and efficiency, we'd only have this term. We try to balance the two. Um, and that's what led to the method of VCMP, variable compact um, multipoint uh, flux approximation. And uh, so for a case like this, a two-point flux would handle this very poorly because the flow is at an angle. It's not oriented with the grid. But VCMP would handle it uh, much more accurately. So these numbers are errors uh, in, ter in terms of replicating the global flow. Uh, so these errors are far smaller than these other competing methods. Um, also, if you have channels, the red and orange indicate high permeability channels where fluid can flow. So we can handle those cases quite effectively um, also. Um, and when we combine these with a transport equation, so what I've described now is a flow equation, a transport equation where S refers to saturation. So W is water, SW is water saturation. Ideally, we'd be studying saturation of like oil, water, gas, all of these components. But I'm just doing a simplified model here. And uh, I actually had to do this video clip outside of Adobe Reader. Okay, I'll have to make this bigger. So what you'll see happening is over time, the saturation front is advancing from left to right. Here's the fine scale so, uh, that we're using to compare against. And you see this being faithfully replicated in a, at a coarse scale. Watch the grid. We have large cells over here, smaller cells over here. As the front advances, the, the cells keep getting refined. And if I were to let this run longer, you would see cells back here start to coarsen up again as the, the saturation front advances. Like, at some point, it's going to move on from here. Uh, but it did a good job of uh, reproducing its fine scale behavior at a coarse scale, therefore, a lot more efficiently. Uh, but there's a lot more work to do. So one of my PhD students, uh, James Quinlan, is working on generalizing what I've shown you from 2D <coughs> to 3D. Um, and there's a lot of other details to attend to also. But at least uh, we got some good results in 2D. Um, I kind of I actually abandoned this work when I came to USF to work on other things. But now that I've uh, 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 filled it up more, trying to uh, bring this work back and, and move it forward. Um, so if you go to my web page, um, then you can see all my papers on all of these subjects and um, other things. Um, so that's an overview of my research topic. And hopefully, at least any of you are able to understand anything. <laughs> so uh, thank you.
back in 2005, uh, I go see one of the, you know, the, the plenary talks where like one of the, some guy who was the most senior researcher at ExxonMobil. Um, so everybody's watching to see his talk. And I see what he's doing from a numerical linear algebra point of view. And it was insane. He was doing something that was way too expensive. And because he just didn't know that there's better ways to do that. So I asked him about it. Um, and he had no idea what I was talking about. And then a few years later at Stanford, they send Exxon Mobile sends their numerical analysis team leader to give a talk. And I asked him the same thing. But they stopped bringing it up. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, uh, and the thing is, um, this is why uh, I, this is actually one of the reasons why I started the science student chapter here, um, the, only, the only one of its kind in Mississippi, and there's my shameless plug for it, is to make students aware of these kind of mathematical careers that are out there. A lot of students, when they come, become interested in math in high school, it's like, oh, you want to teach? Um, and about half our majors are in the licensure program. Um, but there is so much more to that. Um, and uh, starting again, we have all this oil drilling going on off, off the coast um, you know, in, in, in this region. That's, a, that, that's something of importance, too. Um, and it's a good idea to combine your interest in math with some other discipline. Uh, I, I double majored in math and computer science. Um, and uh, so, so that you can be prepared to um, that you can be qualified for, for such jobs. And because most companies know that they need, if they have someone with mathematical expertise, that's the thing that they'd rather not train on. Um, so if, if, if an applicant comes to with that, then they can uh, teach them everything else they need. Other questions? Good, because I can't believe my voice has lasted this long. <laughs>